We're happy to be here with you today. Uh, happy to have the opportunity to put on a shirt with a collar and some buttons and even a belt. I know that's pretty fancy for some of us these days. Um, but we do want to lead you through some of the situations that we're seeing our clients go through. Obviously, many different challenges that they are facing. And we assume that you guys out there are facing some of the similar challenges. We're going to look at this from a labor and employment perspective. I'm going to talk about that. We're also going to deal with this from a small business loan perspective, um, insurance issues that you may be facing, benefits that might be applicable to you personally or to your workforce, and um, also contract considerations, contracts that you might have with vendors or suppliers and the like. So let me start talking a little bit about uh, some of the labor and employment issues that we're seeing. There has been a raft of new labor and employment legislation that's been coming out of Washington and coming out of the state governments. I will note for you um, that one of the things we're really trying to do here is help you guys issue spot, um, see some of the things that you should be concerned about. It's gonna be very difficult for us in a kind of round robin um, format like this to really drill too far into it. And I'll also note for you that there is literally guidance coming out every single day on these issues. And so the law is evolving as we speak. Uh, I even saw headlines last night that the state government here in New York is challenging and suing the federal government for some of the regulations they've implemented recently regarding some of the laws that I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So take all of this with a little bit of a grain of salt. This is a work in progress and the situation continues to evolve. In terms of some of the legislation I wanna talk about, the first two items that I wanna mention come out of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And I'm not gonna uh, try to use the acronym for that because you'll probably wanna reach through the laptop and strangle me if I do, but I'm gonna call it sort of the Paid Family Leave Act and the Paid Sick Leave Law. So first, in terms of the Paid Family Leave Act, this is an expansion of the FMLA. The FMLA usually has applied to employers with 50 or more employees. And this certainly expands that. This applies now to employers with 500 or fewer employees. So it goes very much down to um, the smallest of employers and could potentially affect you, although I'll talk about a very significant uh, exception to the law in a minute or two. What the Paid Family Leave Act provides is for individuals, employees, obviously, who are unable to work due to a school closure or loss of childcare due to a school closure. They are eligible for 12 weeks of paid leave subject to certain caps. Those caps are basically two thirds of salary with a cap of $200 per day, $12,000 overall. And this is also a statute that provides job protection uh, during that leave period. Now that job protection doesn't mean that people can't be laid off, positions cannot be eliminated, but short of that, that individual has job protection during that period of time that they're on leave. The second part of the statute that I want to discuss today is the paid sick leave law. This is different than the paid family leave and it provides for 10 days or 80 hours of paid sick leave and job protection during that period of time. And it's for employees with uh, COVID-19 uh, who are experiencing COVID-19 related quarantine, either from a government order, uh, from a, a doctor, uh, and an, it could be for an employee who is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and has been advised by a healthcare provider to stay at home. And there's a few other different bases upon which um, that sick leave may be provided. And that also is subject to caps. The caps would be $511 per day or $5,110 in the aggregate. So those are two um, you know, significant paid sick and family leave benefits that are being provided by the federal government. What you folks should know, because I believe that a lot of folks in our audience today are running um, medical offices, and there's a huge exception in the law for anyone employed at a doctor's office, hospital, healthcare center, et cetera. 
for folks working in those types of facilities, they are generally not going to be protected or afforded the benefits of the two provisions of the statute that I just mentioned. So to the extent that you are getting requests for this type of leave and you're not inclined to offer it, um, you may be exempted from the responsibilities of those statutes. Now, that doesn't necessarily end the question for you. Um, you still need to be concerned about local state uh, sick leave laws. New York, for instance, has its own sick leave law that does not have an exemption for medical providers. And New York City has certain provisions. And you may also have just provisions in your own employment manual that you have to be concerned about. So whenever you're evaluating a question of is someone eligible for leave, you really do need to look at your own policies, city, state, and then federal policies. The next part I want to talk about is some of the benefits that have arisen out of the CARES Act, which is the stimulus bill, and specifically those provisions that apply to employees um, and employees who may have lost hours with you or may have been laid off. The federal government has uh, supplemented now unemployment insurance benefits. States have to opt into the program and there's certain things that states need to do in order to opt in, but once they do, individuals within that state who apply for unemployment insurance benefits are eligible for 600 additional dollars per week um, and they're eligible for 13 additional weeks of federally funded unemployment benefits. So for instance, in New York, you would be eligible for 26 weeks plus 13 additional weeks under the federal law and you'd be uh, eligible for the maximum unemployment insurance benefit in New York, which is $504 plus that 600. So that could be a significant benefit for employees who are at your workplace and who you have had to lay off for one reason or another. Now, of course, they have to be eligible pursuant to the state's own requirements and each state has its own requirements. The other thing that is significant about the unemployment insurance law is that it has expanded coverage, not just for employees, but independent contractors and the self-employed. So that is a fairly significant development. Um, as to receiving those benefits, that's obviously a very different question. We're obviously getting a lot of reports that it's being very difficult for individuals to apply for these benefits. And um, so obviously you have to be careful about what you can promise to your employees, but certainly in theory and on paper, those supplemental benefits are there for them. So those are some of the that's some of the recent legislation that we're seeing um, come out of New York and um, the federal government specifically. But I also want to talk more generally about some of the issues you may be confronting um, with your workforce. If you are looking to reduce your workforce or reduce your spend on payroll, you're probably thinking about a few different steps. One is terminations. One could be layoffs and one could be furloughs. So let me talk about some of those. And of course, you may also be thinking about pay reduction. In terms of terminations, um, that's obviously a more permanent decision than a, a layoff or a furlough. You have to think about why someone's being terminated. Is this a business reason? Is this a performance-based reason? What type of documentation there is to support the decision? Again, when we talk about termination, I'm thinking more usually about a one-off um, but it could come in the context of terminating a group of people in a department. You always want to be able to justify those decisions and document them in the event that they are challenged under some sort of theory of discrimination or otherwise. You also want to do some type of demographic review of who's being terminated um, and whether or not the individuals being selected for termination could uh, make some sort of allegations that it was a discriminatory termination. So any of those decisions should be reviewed with counsel. When we talk about a layoff as opposed to a furlough, those terms are not specifically de defined in the law, uh, but they do have a sort of term of art uh, to them. Usually with layoffs, we are talking about, again, a temporary situation where there is some expectation that the individual may be recalled. You wanna be careful that that's not a guarantee um, of, of recall but there is at least an expectation of that and that the person is not being permanently 
um, terminated. So that's a, a significant issue in terms of layoffs. One of the things that we are seeing folks do is discuss whether or not they can continue benefits during that period. Um, and certainly that is an option. There's a few different ways to do that. You can continue benefits by making an arrangement with your carrier. Um, you could also continue benefits through the use of COBRA. One thing though that you do wanna be careful about is obviously there can be times in a layoff where the individual will not be performing any services. And in fact, they shouldn't be performing any services during a layoff. And so you have to be very clear with your carrier that that is gonna be the arrangement. You don't wanna be involved in a situation where you're trying to provide benefits to the carrier and the carrier doesn't know that the individual is not performing any services because that could technically make them ineligible for benefits under their plan. Um, the real difference that we see in terms of furlough versus layoff is oftentimes with a furlough, you are making some sort of commitment to continue and pay for benefits during the layoff period. That does not mean that the individual wouldn't be eligible for unemployment. They would still be eligible for unemployment. Um, there are different rules in different states, but in New York, for instance, um, you can be working up to three days a week and still making up to $504 and remain eligible for unemployment. If you're gonna be doing something separate from layoffs, in other words, uh, doing some sort of pay reduction, salary reduction, that's all possible. There's a lot of creative ways to do that. Um, you need to be careful about a few things. You wanna be providing written notice and acknowledgement that people's rates of pay or salaries have changed. You wanna be particularly concerned with your salaried exempt people. If you're reducing pay for salaried exempt people, they could drop be below a salary threshold in various states, and then they become no longer an exempt salaried employee, but an hourly employee, which means you have to treat them differently in terms of keeping track of their time and their overtime and, and those various issues. So that's an important issue. Finally, when it comes to layoffs, depending on how many layoffs you're doing, you may be triggering some of the, the war notice statutes. So for example, in New York, um, you may be seeing, if you have 50 or more employees and you're laying off or reducing compensation of 25 or more of those individuals, you will have certain notice obligations. In New York, it's a 90-day notice period. So those are some of the, the sort of the basic concerns and considerations that we're seeing our clients wrestling with. I didn't want to drill into too much detail on any one of them in particular. Um, I do want to open it up for any Q&A that folks might have, um, and we can try to dig into some of those questions. So Mike, are you seeing any questions come in? We have, we've got a, a few popping in. Um, when we see is, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to retain my employees, but there's not enough for them to do. What, what steps should I be taking? Well, you know, again, I would, I would sort of harken back to some of the issues we've just discussed. There's a variety of different things to do. Um, we are seeing some of our clients really look at a package of either reducing days of work so that people can become eligible for unemployment, uh, reducing compensation in some way, but trying to keep people retained through some form of reduction of compensation, reduced days of work, and making them eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. So that is certainly one approach. Uh, another approach we are seeing is people being encouraged to use either vacation time or accrued leave banks in order to get them through a period of time with the company supplementing that as best as possible. So one of the things you have to decide as an employer, obviously, is, you know, how, is imp how important is it for me to retain this person and what am I willing to do uh, in order to keep them retained? Um, this is also uh, an opportunity for folks to look more critically at their workforce and make determinations about how a set you could just back up maybe 15 or 20 seconds, Josh. I think we may have. Sure. I, I was just saying that, you know, we are seeing employees or employers take a variety of different approaches to this, really just a combination of reducing days of work so that folks become eligible for some of the more generous unemployment insurance benefits, 
while still maintaining some level of connection to the workforce um, and being able to maintain their benefits. So that's certainly one of the approaches. Uh, one more that came in, can I compel my employees to use vacation time if they're not busy? You can um, generally, but there's a few caveats to that. Number one, you wanna review your own policies and you wanna review state law. Many states basically just um, hold you accountable for your written policies and treat your written policies almost as a, a statutory benefit. That's certainly the case in New York, It's the case in California. In New York, if you say you're going to do X, Y, and Z things under your vacation policy, then you really need to do that, and your violation of your own policies could be considered a statutory violation. That said, in most states, you have the right to amend your vacation policies. It would come with some sort of written amendment, and notification to your employees. But you could, in many situations, require, ask people, uh, even, even compel people to use vacation time to fill in the gaps of their um, sort of lack of work or time off. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a couple questions come in with PPP funding. I think we'll, we'll wait for Chris to address those on a more uh, tangible, tangible basis. Uh, sure. I do have one more. Uh, what if my employees is not feeling well, but doesn't have any sick time left? Uh, what's, what's kind of the market sentiment there? Well, you know, it, it's not just the market sentiment. I think there is there's CDC guidance on this. And especially if you're a medical provider, um, I think you need to really think long and hard about sending people home. The CDC guidelines certainly say that anyone with COVID related symptoms should be sent home and should not be returned to work until they are 24 hours without symptoms. And as to whether or not that person should be entitled to paid sick leave, obviously, like we were saying before, you're gonna to need to do a city, state, and federal analysis. Under the federal law, they probably would not be, but they could still be eligible under a city or state law. And then if not, you may just need to make a decision about whether or not you wanna extend paid leave to them during a period, but it would be very risky, it seems to me, under both OSHA standards um, and other standards regarding liability to your workforce to have someone with COVID symptoms in your office, not to mention liability to your patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, you, you know, seeing some, some additional questions come in around PPP, it's a, a timely, uh, I guess, ordering structure that we've done, you know, with Josh really setting the, setting the stage and. Uh, next up, Chris Melville. Thank you, Josh, first of all. Absolutely. Um, for, your, for your insights. Um, <clears throat> next, we're going to be turning to Chris Melville. He's a partner in our banking and finance practice um, and has been, uh, you know, up many nights, uh, you know, working through uh, you know, all the loan opportunities and, and different strategies for folks who uh, you know, are looking for lifelines in, in, in and around uh, the, the profession. So um, thanks, Josh. And, and Chris, we'll, we'll kick it over to you. Um, and I'll be sure to, to kick you with these questions. Uh, to make sure that we're being as responsive as possible. Chris? Thanks, Mike. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, so my talk today, I'm going to talk about uh, three things. Overview of the SBA loan, loans and grants, uh, an overview of uh, the Paycheck Protection Program specifically, and then I'll, I'll be drilling down a little bit on some selected topics of the PPP loans. So let me begin by giving you a, a brief overview. Um, the, SBA, the SBA provides uh, several different types of loans and grants to provide relief during the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, broadly speaking, we can divide these programs into three categories, small business debt relief program, economic injury and disaster loans and grants, and the paycheck protection program. So I'm gonna talk most uh, of my short time today about the pay, uh, PPP loans, but I wanted to talk about the other two briefly. So uh, first up, small debt relief program. This is sort of the bread and butter um, SBA programs. Uh, there's, there's three um, to talk about. One is the so-called 7A program. That's a 5 million, uh, th these are loans of $5 million for small business borrowers who lack credit uh, elsewhere, uh, the use of proceeds provisions are very broad, and the borrower typically applies for these loans through a bank. Uh, next, we have the 504 program. 
loans up to five and a half million, uh, their acquisition loans, real estate, machinery, um, uh, that sort of thing. Borrow applies to a certified development company, which is not a nonprofit corporation uh, that promotes economic development. And the last of these is the mi so-called microloan program. It's uh, loans up to 50,000 to help small businesses start up and expand. Uh, the, so these are sort of the bread and butter um, loans for, for non-disaster non loans, the things that have been around for a while. The CARES Act uh, does um, affect these to the extent that the SBA will cover all loan payments uh, under these loans for six months. Uh, this, the second category of SBA relief to talk about, and again, a thing that's been up and, up and around for a while, uh, are economic and disaster loans. These are uh, often referred to by their acronym, EIDL, EIDL. They're low interest loans of up to $2 million um, that are available to pay expenses that could have been met had the disaster not occurred. Interest rates typically um, for, for for-profit entities, 3.75%, 30-year maturity, there's a one-year deferral, uh, and the borrower can apply for these through the SBA. Um, when, um, if a borrower were to apply, at the same time, the borrower can request in advance, it's called an emergency economic injury grant of, of, of $10,000. And this is an advance that will be forgiven. Um, uh, I say it was 10,000, it was 10,000 until a couple of days ago. Now it's the lesser of $10,000 and $1,000 per employee um, uh, that the borrower uh, employed as of uh, January 31st, um, 2020. Um, a question, uh, if a borrower receives an idle loan or an economic injury grant, can it also get a, get a PPP loan? And the answer is yes. However, the borrower may not use the EIDL loan and the PPP loan for the same purpose. You, a borrower could use both for payroll, but for they, if it were to do so, it would have to be payroll for different payroll periods. So uh, now I'm gonna go into the PPP loans, but the takeaway from what I just said might be the SBA has loans other than PPP loans and they're, and they're probably worth taking a look at. Uh, should you want to take a look at them, the SBA has a really good website uh, that describes everything I've just told you and more. So now paycheck pr protection programs, a brief overview of that. Um, the purpose of the programs to help small businesses maintain, maintain payroll during the co coronavirus emergencies. These loans have several features uh, that are attractive, they're forgivable, they have low interest, there are no SBA fees, no collateral, no personal guarantees are required and repayment can be deferred for um, six months. Uh, the loans are available through June 30th to 2020. Uh, a, the, PP, uh, the PPP loan program is an expansion of the 7A loan program I mentioned a minute ago. Who can apply? Generally speaking, individuals who operate a sole proprietorship or business uh, entities with fewer than 500 employees that were in operation on February 15th, 2020. Uh, and, and, and in addition, certain not-for-profits. There are other eligibility requirements um, uh, that, that get into gritty, but that's that. Um, those are the basics. How big is the loan? You can borrow an amount equal to your monthly payroll costs uh, times two and a half percent, uh, I'm sorry, 2.5. Um, uh, with a cap of $10 million. So as an example, if a borrower had one employee, oh, and by the way, uh, it's, it's payroll costs, uh, excluding um, uh, salary above 100,000. So for example, if a, a borrower had an, one employee who made $125,000 in salary in 2019, the maximum uh, PPP loan it could borrow would be 100,000 divided by 12 months times two and a half. And that equals $20,833.33. If that, if that employer had uh, 500 such employees, the maximum, uh, the, 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 the result of all that, of that calculation would be 10 million, 10.4 million. So the cap of 10 million 
would kick in. And so the maximum amount would be $10 million. Uh, the terms of the PPP loan, the interest rate is 1%. There's a maturity of two years. Uh, no payment of principal or interest on the PPP loan until uh, uh, after six months after disbursement, though interest will accrue during that six months. Forgiveness. Broadly speaking, uh, the PPP loan can be forgiven up to the full principal amount of the loan and accrued interest, provided that the loan proceeds are used for forgivable purposes and the employee compensation levels are maintained. I, I will talk more about forg forgiveness in a, in a minute or two. Uh, how do you apply? The best way to apply is through your, through your bank. Um, any FDIC bank, certainly any bank doing um, SBA loans in the past, and pretty much any uh, FDIC bank today will, will be issuing loans. Uh, in addition, I think there are some online service providers um, that, that are issuing loans as well. Um, as you may have encountered, uh, if you've already tried uh, to get a loan, um, uh, banks are favoring, you know, there's been a big rush for these loans and banks are favoring their existing customers. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the application process is fairly simple. It's a three-page application. It does include a certification uh, of the following. Uh, the applicant will have to state that, quote, current activity, current, ec I'm sorry, current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant, unquote. Uh, and talking to clients, this is not something that comes up very much because we're dealing with uh, restaurants or companies for whom uh, the coronavirus pandemic uh, has had devastating effects. Um, in preparing for this talk, I, I thought it was interesting uh, to think that some of you all may be in a different spot. Um, I hope you are, uh, but you can one can imagine that, you know, a a pulmonary specialist may be doing quite well, uh, or, 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 or let's say working very hard. So that, that, uh, that person may not uh, be a candidate for this loan. So something for you all to consider. Um, uh, use of proceeds. So the loan, the loan can be used or must be used for the following um, and, not, and nothing else. Payroll costs, healthcare premiums, mortgage, interest payments, not principal payments, but interest payments, rent, utilities, interest payments, and other debt incurred uh, before February 15th, 2020. Uh, there's an interesting article in, not an article, there's a, um, uh, an opinion uh, in the Wall Street Journal today that, that uh, it's, it's quite helpful. I recommend it and highlight some of the, some of the perceived efficiencies of the PPP loan. And one of them is, um, re re related to this, um, businesses can't use the money to pay suppliers, contractors, creditors, or insurers. So keep, keep that in mind. These funds cannot be used for many things that you might, you might use them for. Uh, in, in addition, um, in talking about the, what I just said about the use, use of proceeds comes from the CARES Act itself. There was a, um, a um, final rule or interim final rule uh, from the, came from Treasury, which, which um, um, gives further guidance or has further requirements. And on this topic, i.e. use of proceeds, the, the, there's a requirement that 75% of the loan proceeds must be used for payroll costs. So those utilities, uh, mortgage interest payments, et cetera, they cannot comprise more than 25% of the loan. Now, interestingly, uh, there does not appear to be a deadline by which you can use the loan for those purposes. This is in contrast with the deadline that we'll talk about when we get to forgiveness, which, which basically says uh, forgivable payments have to be used up in the eight, in the eight week pe period from uh, receiving the loan. So use of, there are strict use of proceeds, but it appears to be that uh, you can take your time applying the money to that. So now I'd like to get to a few, few um, 
uh, selected topics related to, to um, PPP loans. Uh, the, uh, and there are three. Uh, one is calculating the number of employees. One is calculating payroll costs. And last, calculating forgiveness. So calculating the number of employees. Uh, the, this, the requirement is that you have 500 or fewer employees. Uh, for, for calculating that number, um, uh, the employer is subject to the SBA's affiliation rules. And these are rather very strict rules that would, uh, where, the, where the SBA will look not just at the employer, but at the employer's parent, and then the subs and other affiliates of the employer. So for example, uh, under a fairly draconian situation, a small company in which uh, a private equity fund is a big investor, uh, that small company's, the number of its employees may get aggregated with the employees of the other, um, uh, with the portfolio companies in, in that private equity, uh, of that private equity fund. I'm gonna guess that's not a big issue for you all. It is a big issue for many people. The affiliation rules are very complex. If it is for you, I encourage you to uh, discuss them with your accountant. Uh, next up, calculating payroll costs. This is um, quite important um, for um, uh, uh, of the PPP loan because uh, you need to calculate loan size and loan forgiveness. So payroll costs include salary, wages, and, and, and pretty much what you think it might include. Excluded from payroll costs uh, are, as I mentioned before, salary compensation in excess of 100 grand and compensation of employees not resided, who don't reside in the US. Question, do independent contractors count as employees? No, they do not. Uh, I, 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 there was a lot of um, uh, confusion on this topic, and it wasn't resolved until the until the final rule appeared uh, uh, like April third. Um, but just know that, uh, for uh, for example, if if you're a doctor and you have some kind of relationship with, let's say, a dietitian who comes into your office and with whom you work, and who uh, avails itself of your billing and who you pay and with and who is a private uh, independent contractor of yours, you cannot add that person's compensation to your payroll costs. Uh, if an applicant uh, quickly, because I think I'm running out of time, um, it, uh, people have asked about what about PEOs? These are uh, uh, entities which will process your payroll and there's a kind of a legal fiction where your employees are actually listed on their uh, tax forms as their employees. For purposes of, of, of um, the PPP loans and the SBA Act, they are your employees, so you can count them if that's your situation. Forgiveness, first thing to say about forgiveness is that there is a lot of ambiguity here. Um, uh, even in the final rule, which I mentioned a, a minute ago, uh, there's a line at the end that says SBA will, addition, will issue additional guidance for loan forgiveness. Generally speaking, uh, principal and interest on a loan will be forgiven if the loan proceeds are used for a forgivable purpose and the employee and, and, and the compensation levels are maintained. So the CARES Act itself defines what these forgivable purposes are. We could call them forgivable payments. There are four. Payroll costs, which we talked about a second ago, interest on mortgage obligations in effect prior to February 15th, rent on leases in effect prior to February 15th, and utilities for, for services which began prior to February 15th of this year. So, so you, you can, uh, uh, excuse me, and um, it's, it's the payment of these forgivable payments or the sum of these forgivable payments beginning on the day you get the loan and eight weeks later, you add up all of that and you apply it against your loan and that is the forgivable amount. How, subject to the following limitations. Um, if you reduce your um, uh, salary, I'm sorry, your, the number of employees 
during that eight week period, as compared with an earlier comparison period, and there are three different ones that you can pick from, but basically uh, it's a period during which before the corona hit. If the number, uh, so you have to take your, 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 your payments, uh, your forgivable payments and, and multiply it by this fraction. The numerator is the number of employees in the eight week period. The denominator is the number of employees you had during this comparison period. And, and um, you know, the result is, is the amount that's forgivable. So if you had 80 employees in the eight week period and 100 before, it's 80%, you multiply your uh, forgivable payments by 80%. Lo loan forgiveness can also be reduced. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm getting a message and I apologize for going over, but I just wanted to mention loan forgiveness can be reduced by the amount of reduction in salary during that eight week period uh, for people whose salary has been, been, been reduced by more than 25%. The good news on both of these, um, reduction, um, uh, cases of reduction is that if you restore the number, the number of your employees back up to that pre, pre Corona number or, and you restore the salary to that, to, to above 25% or, or, or actually to, to that, to their former salary, uh, you don't have to, um, uh, those reductions that I just described do not apply. So you have it, if you do it, I'm sorry, if you do it by June 30th, 2020. So you have some wiggle room there to, to wait and get back up and, and, um, and not have those reductions apply to forgiveness. So, um, Mike? Yeah, no, uh, uh, <laughs> fantastic. Obviously lots of, lots to take in. Um, you know, and, and you know, certainly uh, it's a it's a topic of significant uh, interest and concern. We we had a, a bunch of questions come in, so I just wanted to make sure that we were responsive to folks. Um, but again, obviously a, a very important component um, of the CARES Act. So, you know, hearing all of this great stuff, is there is there any reason people shouldn't apply for for this loan out of the gate? Is yeah. So this is very interesting. I had a conversation with a client a very famous, uh, world famous um, dining venue. Uh, and they have already received their, their pay. They, and, and now they don't know what to do with it. And, and what they're, what they're uh, worried about is the restaurants cannot bring their employees back in. And so it's great that they have this low interest loan, but they're not going to be, they may not be able to spend very much of that money on uh, set, uh, on payroll during the next eight weeks. So you're starting to see a lot of articles out there now, which uh, especially um, uh, geared toward people who have, who, whose employees work in the public that say, wait, do not apply for your loan now. You want to wait. Um, so that's the main thing. It, um, I, Somewhat related, you might if you think you can tell your bank, well, I'll apply, but I'll just tell my bank not to give me the, the money for a while. The the final rules actually say the bank has to give you give you the money in ten days. It, it, you may be able to ask your bank to wait ten days, but that's the most you could do, and I'm not even sure they would do that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention on this topic, uh, you should know that your your loan. The details or the broad brush term, the, the terms of your loan are discoverable under the Freedom of Information Act. So the amount that you borrow, who your owners are, the term, et cetera, whether you pay or not, people will be able to find that out um, under the Freedom of Information Act. Okay. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions here. You've got a sole proprietor who may not specifically receive a paycheck, uh, you know, perhaps just, you know, kind of getting, uh, sure. you know, yeah, something so, at the end of the year, do they qualify? Absolutely. Sole proprietors, um, the rules are a little bit different. In fact, got some guidance came out yesterday. Uh, it, it, the easy, the quickest way for me to describe it is just pretend you're a company 
and your your payroll costs are are, are what you pay yourself. So you would you would you would look at your income from last year, 2019, or you could also look at it from from the 12 months prior, and and calculate your payroll costs just like a company would. So there's some minor differences, but 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 broadly speaking, yes, absolutely. Um, I talked about independent contractors earlier, and I wanted to mention that in my example, I forgot to, I forgot to tell you, I think I used a dietitian in a doctor's office. That dietitian can apply for a PPP loan her, uh, by herself or himself. Mm -hmm. And how does a PPP, how does that interact with the furlough process? How does that, we uh, it's touched on that a little bit. But they are. I mean, obviously, as long as it they're numerator. actually unrelated. They're, I mean, this is very interesting. An interesting thing about this loan is <laughs> there's no requirement that you suffer. I mean, it's very interesting. At the beginning, I said you have to certify, uh, and the, and I read you the language. It basically says that you you, you know you've you've suffered a an adverse effect because of an economic effect. But there's actually a scenario that some of my colleagues and I were kicking around. Imagine you're, you're, you own a widget company. Uh, on, on, on April 1, you know, everything looks terrible. Like you, all your orders have been canceled, everything, it's horrible. You, five days later, you, you apply for your uh, loan, truthfully. You, you ten, a week after that, you get your million dollars and then a week later, someone discovers that your widget is instrumental in, in manufacturing the cure of the vaccine. And now you've got your factory running seven days a week, 24 hours a day. How much of, if you, if you take your million dollars and you pay it for, to payroll, you, that loan is forgiven. So, you know. <laughs> They're, they're, they don't like look and see. There's no netting out of what you didn't get. I mean, you, I mean, the, you know, so. Yeah. That's a uh, great, great question and an interesting uh, component. I see Josh jumped on for a sec. Mike, I just wanted to note um, another labor employment perspective on that question. And I think it's really just a restatement of what Chris was explaining earlier and maybe gets at a piece of the question as well which is that if by furlough you mean individuals are being laid off, obviously, as Chris explained, those layoffs can be taken from your loan forgiveness and affect the percentage of loan forgiveness that you're gonna have on that PPP loan. But also, as Chris explained, if you restore those layoffs or those furloughs by June 30th, 2020, you can restore your loan forgiveness to pretty much 100%. Of whatever you had lost due to the furloughs or layoffs, so that's that's part of the way these intersect in terms of furloughs and layoffs. Now you can hear my my dogs participating in the webinar in the background. Well, I'll mute myself again. So that's right. So so, and I missed this, Mike. I guess this is what your point. You were you were focused on forgiveness uh, when you had asked that question, and that's absolutely right. It is relevant to forgiveness. Actually, I have one thing that I want to say on forgiveness uh, that's really important, and that is um, when I was describing the forgiveness um, um, calculations, I, I was describing what you could actually read in the CARES Act itself. However, when the final rule came out, the, there was, the final rule had uh, additional language uh, regarding the 70, that said that 75% of um, that, that, they're, that they're only going to, uh, I'm sorry, a bit for, uh, it's actually a bit tricky. So it says, it says no more than 25% of loan forgiveness can be attributable to non payroll costs. So remember, we're going to forgive uh, this, these four items uh, payroll, rent, mortgage, uh, utilities. But the stuff that we're gonna forgive, 75% of it has to be payroll costs. This was not in the act, it was imposed by the rule. And 
th this is giving a lot of people a lot of heartburn. It, it, they mentioned it in the um, journal thing I meant today. And I, I just want to give you a, an example. I, I know I'm taking time, but this is really important. There are people who think, people, the, the client that I mentioned earlier, so they've got this loan and, um, and I'm going to make these numbers up. Uh, it was a million dollars. They're, they're like, the most we're going to do is spend 500,000 on payroll costs. And, and we got another 500,000 of, of these other costs. The only thing that's going to be forgivable are, are the following, the 500,000 for payroll costs. And they, the, these guys thought, well, of that other 500,000, 250,000 is going to be uh, forgivable because 500 and 250 is 75% of a million, but that's not how it works. The language says no more than 25% of loan forgiveness may be attributable to non-payroll costs. So you have to calculate, in my example, it was 500,000 for payroll costs. 500,000, is 75% of what? Well, it's 75% of uh, 600,666. So that means in my example, they're only gonna be able, of the non-payroll costs, only 100,666, I'm sorry, 166,000 will be forgivable. Now, if you have zero, if you got a loan and, 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 you, and you're a restaurant and you just have no payroll costs, you're gonna, and you have, in my example again, you got a million dollar loan and you have 750,000 of non-payroll costs, zero is, is going to be forgivable. And I think because, because if you tried to do 250, 250, that's too much. I think, I think you get the math and I apologize if, if I'm, um, if you're sense. not, but yeah, yeah okay. So I think, I think this is actually going to be very upsetting and surprising to a lot of people when they realize this. Um, and, and, and finally on this topic, um, this could change because people are complaining about it uh, and we might see some relief on this, but that's how it's currently worded. Great. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Obviously a, a hot button issue for folks, not just in the medical and, and uh, dental space, but no, really, really around all the industries. <clears throat> um, so thank you for your time. Uh, right. Folks, thank you know, you. we have any additional questions, we'll certainly try to reach out to you individually to get them answered. Um, but in the interest of, of keeping uh, moving along, we have another gentleman, Chris Lober, uh, who I'd like to introduce. Chris leads our insurance recovery and defense practice. Um, he is a, um, been a, a very busy man himself, uh, you know, working through, uh, you know, claims and, and how those things are done. Um, and, and working with our clients virtually around the clock. Chris, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us and we'll uh, have, you, have you take it. Yeah, you bet. Okay, thanks, thanks Mike. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, what I wanted to do in the somewhat limited time we have here is, is give a very high level overview. Um, I wanna start talking generally about the types of coverages that could be implicated by COVID. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the specific policy language and um, then talking about the approaches that we're seeing that, that certain carriers are taking here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some, some state and federal initiatives that, that could help policyholders. Uh, and then I want to talk lastly about uh, your messaging, meaning what statements are you making? Uh, are you posting signs on your doors? Are you sending messages out to employees? Are you doing interviews or making any public public comments? Because all of those can uh, impact the, the, the overall insurance that you may be entitled to collect. So, so let me start with just an overview of insurance. There are two basic types of policies uh, that could be implicated here. Uh, we, we refer to them generally as first party uh, policies and third-party policies. Your typical first-party policy is a, um, a property coverage. Uh, sometimes it's called an all-risk policy. Um, the, the typical third-party is the general liability policy. And the basic difference is your, your property policy will 
give you insurance to cover damage to your premises and your business interruption losses that flow from an event. The liability policies are designed to protect you if someone were to sue you, say that, for example, I, I came into the office and I was not you know, infected and I got infected and boy, it's your fault and I'm going to sue you for that. Right now, we're gonna concentrate on the first party property policies because those are the most likely to have uh, a near term trigger. We're certainly happy to talk if you have individual questions about liability questions for the basic. We can certainly talk about that as well. Um, but but basically, and, and, and this comes from the perspective, I will say, that, that we represent policyholders. So we represent policyholders in claims against their carriers. So this is, you know, everything that I say is going to be from that perspective. How do we get policyholders the maximum amount of insurance coverage to which they're entitled? So let's focus um, for, for the balance here on the idea of um, uh, the, the uh, first party property. Uh, there was a very, unfortunately, there was a very good example over the weekend of your traditional uh, property damage situation. The, the, the tornadoes that went through the South, it, insurance companies can get their arms around that. They can look at that and say, okay, that was an event that caused physical damage. Because your property policy is divided into two parts, you talk about replacing that property which is damaged by the event, and then you talk about the, the uh, business interruption, which is effectively your loss of profits that flow from the fact that you sustained physical loss or damage. COVID is a bit different because the insurance companies have an easy time looking at tornado damage because they can see it. They seem to be, to, to be taking this position though that you cannot have physical damage that's caused by a virus. And we clearly disagree with that. There's nothing in any policy that we've seen that indicates that you have to have a, uh, a, a visible, in other words, you, you can have a microscopic event that causes damage in the same way that you can have a very visible event like a tornado, hurricane, wildfire, et cetera. So when we, when we start at that point, uh, it leads to another question. And this is going to depend on the individual wording of your specific policy. Um, if you have had a COVID uh, infection at your office, then we may look at your policy and argue that that is a trigger for the loss. If you have not had a COVID event at your office, then you may look to other coverages. Policies, when you're looking at your, your business interruption coverage, and many of you may have looked at this already, there is almost always a specific type of coverage that's available if there is a civil authority order. And that's where what we're seeing all around the country when a federal or state or local authority comes in and says, you must shut down. You cannot operate your business. You cannot leave your home. You have curfews. There are restrictions on where you can go and, and, and when you can go and what you can do. And so, and so we need to look at individual policies because if you have had uh, an infection, and, and again, I need to say at this point, you, you've heard, and, and particularly uh, Josh was talking about this at the top, there are many employment issues. Uh, there are privacy issues. Uh, there are all types of other legal issues that come in here. So you must be very careful when, we're, when we are identifying whether or not you've had COVID-19 uh, damage or, or uh, impact at your premises. You certainly don't want to call any individual employee or patient out for being infected. As you all well know, there are all types of, of uh, privacy concerns that we don't want to get ourselves in any type of trouble there. But for strictly speaking from the insurance perspective, we do want to look at any evidence that we have of an infection because that could give rise to the claim that we did in fact have the damage that's the trigger for the business interruption coverage under the policy. If there has been COVID contamination, then our argument would be, yes, the damage that triggers the coverage under the policy 
is the actual presence of the virus in our office. And then the analysis flows from there. If there have been no uh, identifiable cases in our particular office, then there's another way at this. And the other way may be that the uh, civil authority actions have prevented us from operating our office, our business, our place of business. And that in and of itself may create a, a bucket of loss that's covered under your policy. Again, very specific policy by policy analysis. Uh, it, it, it's impossible to give specific advice because everybody has different terms in their policies. Everyone has been impacted differently by the, by the virus. Um, the, the insurance carriers are reacting actually very rapidly here, not surprisingly, and they're pretty much taking a blanket position that there's no coverage for COVID-related losses. And, and why are they doing that? Well, there are two basic reasons. Many of you may be looking at your policies and you may see a blanket virus exclusion. And you could tell because it's in big black letters at the top of one of the endorsements to your property policy. And it will say something along the lines of bacteria and virus exclusion. It will say, no matter what happens, there's no way, no how are you going to get coverage for anything related to a virus uh, at, your, at your premises. In another way, and this is a somewhat more subtle way uh, that, that carriers exclude or attempt to exclude virus-related damages from your policy is they will define the word pollutant very broadly to include viruses among a, a laundry list of other items. And then they will put a broad pollution exclusion in your policy. And why do they do this? They do it because they want to encourage you to buy pollution-related coverage, which is available on the market. Now, my, my guess would be that many of those on this call do not maintain pollution exclusion, pollution legal liability coverage, it's called. Um, and, so, and so you probably uh, will be looking to your property policy. And so that's an important analysis to see if that exclusion is in there. The question that we're getting a lot, and this is something, you know, basically take right on is, well, why should I tender a claim if I have these virus exclusions and if the, if the insurance carriers are taking these positions, uh, that, that there's absolutely no coverage? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, there are pathways to coverage, and it will depend on the specific wording, as I said, of your policy. It will depend on the, uh, the specific impact of the virus on your premises. But there are a couple of other uh, uh, items that, that you all may be seeing in the news that are very important to, to uh, keep in mind. Now, the overview here is that when we're talking about insurance law, there is no federal body of insurance law. It has developed on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, and notwithstanding that fact, there are certain principles that every state has adopted when it comes to insurance coverage interpretation, insurance coverage uh, law. And, and one of those things is that if you can come up with a reasonable interpretation that supports coverage, and the insurance company comes up with what they say is a reasonable interpretation that denies coverage, then the policyholder will always win in that situation. And the reason is because the, the Latin term is contra preferendum. The idea is that the the insurance carriers have drafted their policies of insurance, and they can't draft them in a, in a vague and ambiguous way, and then attempt to use that vague language to support a coverage denial. So we as policyholder lawyers, our charge is to find an interpretation of the policy that supports coverage. And as long as we can find a reasonable path to coverage, it doesn't matter if the insurance company is throwing up any type of defense to that, as long as we have a, a, a reasonable, logical path to coverage, we will, we will prevail in a lawsuit. So the, the other interesting thing is on the state level, we're seeing there are at least four states now, and those states are New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, and Ohio, have introduced legislation where they are attempting to force the insurance uh, carriers to pay for COVID-related business interruption losses. Now, there are a couple of, there are a couple of points there that uh, all of the um, uh, states are requiring. It's for, it's for businesses that have fewer than 100 employees in most cases, sometimes 150. Um, and they have to have active policies that were in effect as of early March. 
Um, but but although there are problems here, and it's not a sure thing that these things will take effect, even if your policy were to contain a blanket exclusion, if one of these states were to succeed in forcing the insurance carriers to cover this, then there would be an argument to coverage. Even if you're not in that state, you would, you would have an argument to coverage because most policies contain what they call a liberalization clause, which says if there is a change in the coverage that takes place during the policy period, and, and we are, we, the insurance company, are uh, offering that additional coverage, then any policy that, that uh, would, would qualify would be entitled to this broad coverage. coverage. Okay. So, so um, the, the general advice here is you must tender a claim. And what that means is you must go to your insurance carrier right now and say that you have been impacted by COVID and that you are tendering a claim under the policy. And, and if you do that, uh, you will be in the game, as we say. The problem is that many insurance carriers and even some insurance brokers are discouraging their policyholder clients from tendering claims. And there are many reasons why that is, and I won't go into them now, but, but our advice to our clients is do not hold back. Policies require that you tender a claim to your insurance carrier as soon as you become aware of a loss or a situation that could result in a loss. And so if, if you as the policyholder decide that you're not going to tender a claim now, because maybe you say, well, we, we don't know what the impact is going to be. Maybe we don't know if we are going to have coverage. So we'll sit back and we'll wait and we'll see how it develops. And so if insurance coverage lawyers like me become successful down the road at convincing courts that yes, in fact, the insurance carriers are wrong and, and this coverage does exist in the policies, or if there is a situation where the states or even the federal government, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, come in and, and pass laws that require this coverage, if you then three months, six months, a year down the road decide, hey, this is great, things have changed and now I have a, a, a viable claim, the insurance company is going to come to you and say, no, your claim is denied because you didn't timely tender it. You knew about it in April of 2020 and you waited. And the fact that you waited has prejudiced us and therefore we're not going to, we're not going to. So two quick points and then I'll finish up and, and, and take any questions. The, the, the one point is after 9-11, uh, even though there's no federal insurance law, as I said, the federal government does get involved uh, and, and can uh, uh, take steps to try to encourage the insurance industry to move in a certain direction. Following 9-11, uh, the federal government passed what was called the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, TRIA. Uh, don't expect that many people are uh, reading their policies too much, but if you are, you would, uh, you would see in your policies that there is a TRIA endorsement. And that's a situation where the insurance companies are backstopped by the federal government. So if there is a terrorism related loss, the government pays a certain percentage and your insurance carriers pay a certain percentage. One thing that was just floated in Congress is the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act or PREA. And that would be, uh, if, it, if it goes through, and again, this is all very much up in the air, if it goes through, what that would do is create a similar backstop for COVID related losses, where it would be a shared risk between your, your insurance carrier and the federal government. So that may well uh, also create some uh, coverage here where it might not otherwise exist. And so my final point is to touch on messaging. Now messaging is very important because if you are going to make a claim under your policy, you must show that you were impacted by the disease, by the virus. And if you have postings on your door, or if you have sent messages to employees, or if you intend to communicate, or if you give interviews, or anybody you talk to, uh, those are public statements that you're making. And if you say, we are shutting down because we are being a responsible business, we are shutting down because we can't take any risks or put any of our people at risk, that's obviously understandable, and that's a, that's a, that's a normal reaction. The problem in the insurance world is, your insurance company will take that statement and it will wave it back in your face and say, wait a minute, if you're making a claim 
that claim requires that you were directly impacted by COVID. And if you weren't, then, then you, know, you don't have any coverage because we don't cover you for doing the altruistic thing here. We only cover you if you have damage that's directly caused by that virus. Okay, so with that, I know we've covered a lot of ground. I'm not sure if there are questions that have come in or. Yeah, we got, got two quick ones before, uh, you know, in the interest of time and in our, in our fun speed round here. Uh, hopefully no one's getting tested on those acronyms you were trucking around there. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Um, if, if you make a claim, do premiums go up next year? Uh, that's a good question. That's one that we're seeing a lot. Some people are hesitant to make a claim because they're afraid their premiums are going to go up. I mean, look, the reality is everybody's premiums are going up next year, whether you make a claim or not, because uh, the, the insurance industry is looking at, you know, I think the, the, the numbers that we've seen most recently are 200 to 300 billion with a B dollars in claims per month in the United States alone. So, yeah, that, that if you're afraid your premiums are going to go up, they are. And that's no reason not to tender a claim. Okay. Uh, what about if a landlord who owns a retail building, you've got your tenants who are being ordered to shut down by the state, they're not paying their rent. Does a landlord qualify for a BI claim under that? Obviously, it's a unique situation. And um, Yeah, you could, you, you could very well. Uh, there are, there are um, certain policies and certain provisions that deal with rents and lost rents as a result of a covered loss. And so again, it, it, it is the same issues apply. You would need to determine that you did sustain a loss that was covered and intended to be covered under your policy. And then in addition to your lost profits, in addition to your you know, extra expenses to get your business up and running again, you could very well have coverage for lost friends. Great. Well, thanks. We've got, got a few more here and, and certainly folks, we will try to reach out uh, you know, after the fact uh, and certainly provide our contact information. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for your time. Um, we're gonna turn it over to Shane Stroud. Shane is uh, head of our uh, employee benefits, executive compensation practice. Uh, obviously some issues that, you know, are, are, are obviously it's a lot connected here. Uh, we'll kick it over to Shane uh, for uh, some of his thoughts and, and insights and what he's seeing in the market these days. Shane. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'll touch on, uh, Touch on briefly, you know, give you a high level overview of the employee benefits related items uh, that were addressed in the, in the CARES Act. As you may all uh, know, uh, it's, been, it's made the most mainstream press. Uh, stimulus checks uh, for taxpayers were authorized by the CARES Act. I saw an article this morning that said 80 million taxpayers are expected to receive uh, distributions this week. To give you just a quick overview on that, individuals may be eligible. Uh, for a one-time payment of, uh, of $1,200 or $2,400 in the case of individuals filing a joint return, um, provided uh, their income does not exceed certain specified thresholds. Um, and the IRS and the federal government were looking at individuals' 2019 tax returns to determine eligibility. Um, and if an individual hasn't filed uh, in 2019, the government will look back to 2018 returns. Uh, Individuals are also eligible for stimulus checks, uh, a one-time payment of $500 per qualifying child. Um, the, uh, the amount of the one-time payments is reduced um, as an individual's income exceeds applicable thresholds. Uh, the, the thresholds uh, work out such that an, a single individual with no children who earns more than $99,000 annually or a couple with no children who earn more than $198,000 annually would not receive uh, a stimulus payment. Um, the income thresholds uh, uh, where there's a ratable reduction down to zero uh, start at $75,000 per year in compensation in the case of an adult filing uh, a single return, $150,000 in the case of a, a couple filing a joint return, and $112,500 in the case of a head of household. Um, return. Um, and so I mentioned checks were going out this week or, or distributions, direct deposits. Paper checks that go out uh, will take longer. I've seen estimates of anywhere from 15 to 20 weeks from the beginning of April. Uh, I know that uh, government officials when asked have said that, uh, that they're working to get those out as quickly as possible and that uh, hoping to avoid uh, a delay as long as, 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 as four to five odd months out. Um, 
the CARES Act also uh, authorized uh, a federal supplement to state unemployment benefits, uh, which works out to an additional $600 per week uh, for an individual out on, uh, on, on state unemployment benefits. Uh, to receive that extra $600 per week, the state or a state has to uh, agree to, to participate in the, uh, in, in the program under the terms and conditions of the CARES Act, but it's an additional, uh, meant, meant for additional relief for workers temporarily uh, unemployed due to COVID-19. Perhaps most importantly from an uh, employer standpoint, uh, the CARES Act has a number of provisions that uh, affect tax qualified retirement plans like 401k plans, uh, or, for, or if you're a not-for-profit 403b and 457b plans. Um, the CARES Act, uh, one of those items, the CARES Act creates a new distribution option for participants. Uh, this allows a participant to take distributions of up to $100,000 from their uh, retirement plan, uh, as long as they do so before December 31 of this year. Um, and if they do so, they do not incur the 10% early withdrawal penalty that uh, we're likely all familiar with, uh, which typically applies to withdrawals made prior to age 59 and a half. Um, this distribution option only applies if a participant has experienced adverse financial consequences re resulting from the coronavirus and the participant has to make a certification, written certification to his or her employer of that fact. Um, and the employer can rely on that certification, uh, a bit of paperwork, but, um, but a requirement spelled out in, in the CARES Act. Um, and if a participant takes such a, such a distribution, uh, he or she has up to three years to repay the amount back to the plan uh, without the amount being taxed as income. Um, and a participant may like to repay all or a portion of that uh, distribution at any point during the three-year period. So lots of flexibility. Um, and, and perhaps the, the high-level takeaway there is it's um, ready and e relatively ready and easy access uh, to cash for employees who might uh, otherwise find themselves in a bind, cash flow bind, um, given current circumstances. Um, this can be implemented uh, immediately if you haven't talked with your, or spoken with your uh, third party administrator. Um, um, in our experience, third party administrators out there are all familiar with, with these provisions and they're working if they haven't already, to get their websites up and, and prepared for these types of requests and distributions. Um, the, the CARES Act didn't uh, affect, uh, let's call it normal hardship withdrawals under ordinary circumstances. If someone under certain circumstances is experience a, experiencing a hardship, they can receive a, um, receive a distribution from their tax qualified retirement plan, from their 401k plan. Uh, since the, since a, a change in law in 2018, uh, hardship distributions include uh, distributions related to federally declared disaster areas. And as you may have seen in the news, I believe it was yesterday, uh, the president has declared a state of emergency or federal disaster areas in each of the, uh, each of the 50 states. Um, and under these disaster area rules, plan participants may take hardship withdrawals to cover expenses and losses, including loss of income uh, incurred by the participant on account of the disaster. Um, to the extent uh, you, you as employers haven't communicated with participants to explain availability and details of these distribution options, we would recommend doing so and be happy to, to speak with you about how to best communicate uh, the availability of these, of, of these alternatives. Um, and, and, and so the, these options can be implemented uh, immediately um, with, with amendment to follow. Um, on a related note, uh, that what I just described about uh, called extraordinary distributions and, and the potential for repayment uh, awfully sounds like a loan, but there's a separate plan loan provision uh, that was authorized by the CARES Act. So for up to for the next six months, participants can borrow up to the lesser of $100,000, which is increased from uh, $50,000 under, under a prior law, or their entire vested account balance. Uh, which was also 50%, uh, or excuse me, 50% of the best of the account balance under prior law. Uh, these plan loans, uh, no, no, no payments or repayment uh, amounts are required in 2020, uh, although interest will accrue. And this, on a similar note, uh, if you haven't had a discussion with your, with your third-party administrator, uh, 
uh, certainly worth doing so and, and, and having a conversation with council to make sure that uh, participants are aware of what alternatives are out there, new alternatives are out there for them. Um, the CARES Act also suspended required minimum distributions from tax qualified uh, plans, defined contribution plans and, and IRAs for 2020. Uh, this applies both to required minimum distributions due in 2020 in respect of 2019, as well as the required minimum distributions due in 2021 in respect of 2020. Uh, not it's not entirely clear if this was an oversight uh, in enacting uh, the CARES Act, but this waiver of required minimum distributions um, uh, does not currently cover tax qualified defined benefit plans. There are, there's, there are a few uh, welfare plan changes in the CARES Act um, that, uh, that touch on uh, covering telehealth and remote care services on a pre-deductible basis, for example, under high deductible health plans, uh, changes to the rules on over-the-counter uh, medications and, and, and reimbursement rules around health savings accounts and flex spending arrangements. Um, and I know that I'm getting uh, tight on time here. Um, I'd be happy to have, my team would be happy to have a conversation with any of you if you have questions around the uh, retirement and welfare benefit uh, plan items addressed by the CARES Act and be happy to interface with your, uh, your providers and administrators uh, if you'd like. Any, uh, any questions come in? Yeah, I had a few come in here. Thanks very much. Um, with respect to the coronavirus provisions that you, you mentioned, do plans need to be amended? Or is there a due date there? They'll have to be amended, uh, but not immediately and not in order to implement the provisions I described. So it's um, in the interest of time, these extraordinary loans, extraordinary uh, distributions can be made. And so long as the plans are amended by um, the end of the uh, plan year ending uh, in 2022. Okay. Um, if you took 100K from your plan and certify you were affected by the virus, you don't need to have backup documentation because that's we've already declared it a federally you know declared emergency area. Is that is that accurate? And so you wouldn't need an audit trail to say that hey you know this this affected me or on the on on the um, this is with respect to the hardship distribution for federal taking out a four hundred one k loan from your oh from your okay plan. right so I guess it's sort of in two buckets on the on the take a distribution and perhaps pay it back over three years or decide later whether you're gonna pay it back or take it into income, you have to make a, a written, uh, you, a participant, have to make a written certification to your employer that you, basically that you've been affected by the coronavirus, either you or family members um, had, uh, you know, tested positive for, for, for COVID-19 or has had a reduction in hours or cut in pay, with respect to COVID-19. So there's flexibility there. There's a, an itemized list of, um, that if you meet any one of them is, a, is enough. And, and that certification standing on its own is enough for an employer uh, sponsor of the retirement plan to rely upon to, to allow the distribution to take place. The, the hardship withdrawal piece, where if you're in a federal disaster area, if your plan already permits that type of distribution, then there's nothing to say to do, to your point, it, you either are or you aren't in a state that's been declared a federal disaster area. Okay. At this point, every, every state has, uh, has been declared. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, last question before we uh, uh, wrap, wrap it up. Is there any relief for a doctor, dentist, someone on this call who may have a, a DB or, or, or cash balance plan, but they still need to make contributions for 2020? What does that look like? The, de the deadlines have been extended. So we're where uh, where plan sponsors are say used to familiar with that you know uh, contributions by April fifteenth of the year following the year in which um, the, the contributions relate like today's April fifteenth right our tax returns aren't federal tax returns aren't due today because mm -hmm. the deadline's been pushed out to July uh, that applies or corresponds with the, the the deadlines we're all familiar with with respect to plan contributions. Okay, great. Well. Uh, thanks, Shane. I know, again, you know, we're, we're throwing a lot of information out in, in a short amount of time, really trying to be as, as useful as possible. Again, you know, as, as Shane mentions, uh, you know, reach out to any of us or any of your CFS and MW folks. Uh, we're, we're happy to, to help connect the dots for you. So thanks, Shane. Oh, hey, Mike, uh, Mike, if I did, might mention one other thing on an optimistic note. I have had clients already reach out in, uh, in the medical practice space. 
uh, thinking ahead, thinking positively about how to incentivize employees when they come back to stick around and, uh, and, and continue in employment. So somewhat different topic than the CARES Act, but I'd, you know, happy to have conversations with, with folks uh, about what might work for their practice when people, when individuals come back, if there's certain talent that uh, is important to be retained, uh, talking about incentive arrangements uh, down the line. Great. Thanks. Um, so, so, so wrapping up, our, our last speaker is Mike Campoli. Mike uh, <clears throat> is a member of our uh, wider corporate practice, and he's going to be talking about a few of the contractual issues, uh, you know, whether that pertains to, you know, specific contracts folks have, whether that's cleaning or uh, materials, essentially supply chain, uh, things of that nature, just, a, you know, another consideration for you folks, um, you know, uh, you know, again, kind of a wide array of vets who may be really busy and dentists, uh, you, you know, who may not be and, and just, you know, really wanting to uh, provide as much information as possible. So, Mike, I'll let you take that away. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mike Campoli, and I'm a partner in our corporate practice group. And I'm going to talk to you, as Mike mentioned, about some of the general corporate and contractual considerations that may be important to you right now as you evaluate your ability in light of the wide-ranging impact of COVID to fulfill your obligations under your commercial contracts and the impact that the non-performance of those obligations may have on your practice. Uh, these include thing, you know, vendor contracts, IT, phone, website, postage, uh, equipment and office management services, uh, supply contracts, advertising contracts, and potentially even leases. Um, now, there are a number of legal theories that we lawyers are exploring right now to help our clients uh, to mitigate some of their performance obligations as a result of the fallout from COVID, most notably force majeure, impossibility or impracticability of, of purpose, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of performance or, uh, perf or frustration of purpose. Now, each of these legal theories is very fact specific and often narrowly applied. So while they can provide some relief in the right circumstances, they're generally not a panacea, unfortunately. Um, and if you cannot get relief under one of these theories, you're often left, as are many of our clients as they deal with the spreading impact of the virus, um, to negotiating directly with your partners to try to find a mutually acceptable, though usually not perfect, solution. So I'll start with force majeure. Uh, what is it? So force majeure provisions or those provisions that are usually found towards the back of your uh, commercial contracts in the miscellaneous section, uh, if they're included at all, um, and they allocate the risk of non-performance among contract parties uh, upon the occurrence of unforeseeable events. Um, under the theory of force majeure, a party's relieved from performing, whether temporarily or permanently, if performance is made impossible by an unforeseeable event that is outside of its control. And usually you see listed things like acts of God or hurricanes or uh, terrorism, governmental action, maybe riots, natural disasters, things like that. Now, whether and how and for how long you can claim relief from a force majeure event uh, depends upon the express terms of the contract. So only events that are listed specifically as being force majeure events or events that are sufficiently similar to those types of events will either excuse performance or will allow for a suspension of obligations until the event ends. Um, whether you can rely on COVID as a reason for non-performance under a force majeure provision depends upon whether uh, the language of the contract sufficiently encompasses things like an outbreak of uh, an illness, a disease, a pandemic. Um, and most contracts don't, which is actually one of the ironies of the situation in that um, this is such an unforeseeable intervening event um, that up to this point, most people weren't thinking about putting this type of event even into their force majeure provisions. Um, so that's, anyway, I guess there's some lesson there. Um, but going forward, certainly I think people will consider doing that, although it was Unlike if we tried to do it a few, uh, I guess a few months ago now, um, when you would be able to think ahead and, and try to get that language in. Now I think there's a heightened sensitivity to it. So trying to uh, negotiate for that type of provision in, or that type of language in a force majeure provision um, may be uh, much more of a fight uh, and a negotiation than, uh, than it was before. 
So most, most force majeure provisions don't include epidemics or pandemics. Um, you may be able to rely on language um, that, would, that would say that a governmental order regulation or emergency declaration uh, constitutes a, uh, a force majeure event if that action is intended to mitigate the spread of the virus and it impedes your ability to perform, which for most of us has probably been the case. Um, but note the broad catch-all provisions are generally not enough. Under New York law, catch-all language, such as for any reason outside your control, we read to include only events similar to those that are expressly listed. So language you know, very much matters when you evaluate a force majeure provision. Um, and we are certainly here and capable of, of you know, going through that language with you. Uh, if your force majeure clause does not expressly mention pandemics, health crises, or government actions, you, your ability to claim the benefits of the provision as a result of COVID are unfortunately slim. Um, if you are in a position where you can assert a force majeure defense, um, you should be careful to make sure you comply with the specific requirements of the clause. If notice is required, but if it's untimely or improper, uh, you may not get the benefits of any relief under the provision, even if the rest of the language is in your favor. Um, also, one of the complications that we've seen is that, um, you know, COVID has been a, a spreading um, situation. Um, it's a rolling threat that makes, you know, sending timely notice more, sending notice um, on a timely basis more difficult than it is for more discrete force majeure events, such as a hurricane. Um, so determining when it is that your business is affected by the force majeure event um, is more difficult to determine. Um, though given the massive waves of closures, cancellations, and, and sheltering in place that we've seen, we've arguably passed that point, probably have. Um, so to overcome this obstacle, some business owners have adopted the strategy of issuing notices on a rolling basis as the impact spreads just to cover themselves. And if you think that you're in this boat, um, you can take, uh, you can apply a similar strategy. Um, you also wanna be mindful of the consequences of asserting a force majeure defense. For example, uh, the assertion of the force majeure event could trigger the other party's right to terminate the contract, which may be a worse situation for you. Um, it may also trigger um, termination rights in other contracts. Sometimes you have other contracts that to the extent that you are um, either asserting defenses or um, admitting some inability to fulfill your obligations that it would give that counterparty uh, the ability to, to terminate that contract. So, you know, if, even if you think this can help you, uh, you do need to think about what the consequences are. And you may also be in a position where the provision requires you to mitigate the, uh, the impact of the force majeure event, which you may not be able to do right now. Um, so that, that discusses you know, force majeure. Generally, one type of contract that warrants some uh, specific attention is, is leases, uh, commercial leases. So, because, because I assume that for many of you, uh, your lease obligations are, are uh, significant. Um, at least compared to others. So the good news is that most leases contain force majeure clauses. The bad news is that by and large, those clauses have not been helpful to tenants in the current crisis. And that's for two reasons. Um, first, as we discussed, to even have a chance of successfully claiming relief, the force majeure clause should, should uh, specifically include an epidemic or pandemic or, or government action that forces you to close. And then second, even if you have that language in your force majeure clause, um, most of the time, and especially with respect to commercial leases, um, uh, payment obligations are specifically not excused by the force majeure event. We have language that says something like obligations other than payment obligations are excused. So um, in the vast majority of situations, your rent payment obligations continue to apply. And obviously your, your landlords, in addition to that, have their own remedies uh, in leases, things like personal guarantees that often include a waiver of defenses, including force majeure, security deposits, which can be offset against, and other self-help me uh, measures that you find in those types of leases. But not all, but all is not lost. Uh, from what we've seen so far, many landlords recognize that this is a unique situation um, and don't want to lose a good long-term tenant due to what we all hope every day 
is a finite problem. Uh, they also recognize that their remedies may be somewhat curtailed uh, in the short term due to disruptions in the court system, uh, and temporary restrictions in certain jurisdictions on landlords exercising remedies against tenants. So what we've seen in a lot of instances is landlords and tenants trying to work together, whether directly or through counsel, um, and sometimes contentiously with each side calling the other's bluff on how they want to proceed uh, in an attempt to find a solution that both sides can live with. Uh, one strategy we've seen is to negotiate for temporary rent deferral uh, accompanied by repayment over some finite period of time, say six to 24 months. Um, also, if your lease has other situation specific provisions that are helpful to you, uh, such as rent relief or, or rent free months at some point down uh, later in the term, uh, you may want to tap into those benefits now when you may need them the most. So the main point is that even if you're having difficult, if you are having difficulty fulfilling your, your obligations uh, to your landlords or you anticipate potentially being in that situation, uh, you should review your lease and start the conversations with your landlord now. Uh, our colleagues in, in, in our real estate group are having those conversations every day. Um, too many to count. So um, it's something to keep in mind if, that's, if that is an issue for you. Um, and then just moving along, if, you, if your contract doesn't contain a force majeure clause or if that clause doesn't apply for any number of reasons that we've discussed, uh, you can potentially rely on common law uh, remedies of impossibility or impracticability of purpose of performance and frustration of purpose. Uh, just very briefly on those doctrines, the doctrine of impossibility and impracticability excuse performance when an unforeseeable intervening event has occurred. Uh, the event must be one that you assume would not occur and has made performance objectively impossible or impracticable. In New York, performance is excused only where it becomes impossible as a result of the intervening event. Uh, some other jurisdictions uh, excuse performance, or sorry, allow an excuse of performance um, where, that, where that performance is impracticable as opposed to impossible. Um, and then non-performance may also be excused under doctrine of frustration of purpose, uh, which applies where an intervening event um, the absence of which was a basic assumption of the contract frustrates the underlying purpose of the contract. So in New York, this defense is limited. It is based on two factors. First, whether performance of a fundamental obligation becomes physically or commercially impossible. And second, whether the purpose of the contract becomes radically different than what was originally contemplated. And if you seek relief for frustration of uh, purpose as a result of COVID, uh, you have the burden of proving that the obligations have been all that have been altered are fundamentals of the contract. So these are, you know, these, these are defenses that are available, um, but you know, they, they really are very you know, specific. They've been narrowly interpreted. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're ones that, um, you know, help to bring parties to the bargaining table uh, so they can, you know, come together to an extent and, and realize the situation that we're in, understand the difficulties that everybody is having with respect to many of their performance obligations under contracts and otherwise, um, and, and you know, find something that's going to work. Um, so that's, in general, you know, what we've seen so far in some of the defenses that we've seen asserted and, and you know, the way that we've seen some of these negotiations go. Great. Well, thanks very much. I, I, I just like, what are some action items for folks who are, who are sitting on the other side of this call? Um, you know, obviously they've got a lot of different contracts, a lot of, a lot of uh, issues and what, what would maybe a couple of uh, recommended action items be for them? Well, a couple of things, there, you know, is that right? You know, unfortunately, outside of some limited situations, these, these defenses to performance are ones that, you know, they're not always on point. You know, you can have your, your, your force majeure clause and the force majeure clause is going to be helpful, but whether you have language in there that you had somebody who was very clairvoyant when you um, drafted the contract, you know, many months or years ago that specifically said if there's a pandemic and COVID and this and that, and it's going to shut down your business and it's going to, you know, provide you with some relief from performance, um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be a slam dunk argument. 
and you're going to have to be prepared and, and we have been prepared and have been part of these discussions to you know talk to your um, counterparty whether it's a landlord whether it's another you know a supplier whether it's um, a service provider um, and kind of you know each side going through their arguments and hopefully coming to some something that they're going to live with um, it's a you know uh, maybe a little bit more difficult in the lease you know situation because you're just dealing with a particular space um, as opposed to something that's sort of a pure contract obligation a payment obligation where you know they your counterparty can can negotiate with you and you with them um, you know purely on you know with respect to how those payments will be made how much when um, and what your continuing you know relationship is with the lease you know you you are talking about a, a specific uh, piece of real estate um, and you know for your landlord is going to come down to you know what's the best thing for them um, in terms of how to use that space you know they're, they're, they're not negotiating with you um, in, in in a vacuum yep. yeah for sure there's a <clears throat> lot of different considerations here especially in light of these times so uh, thanks very much Mike um, and, and thank you all for joining us uh, cognizant of the time here I want to thank our friends at Certified Financial Services, MW Financial, um, you know, great partnership we've, we've developed. Uh, we'll be recording this session and we'll be sending it out, be seeing it, receiving it from uh, either one of our groups. Um, and, uh, you know, any questions, we'll be sending around contact information. Feel free to follow up with us. We're here to help in any way we can. So uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy the day. Thanks so much.